Good evening, everyone. My name is Suzanne DiMaggio. I'm a senior fellow and a director at New America, the host of this evening's event, along with certain partners that I'll be introducing soon. Welcome to this conversation with candidates for UN Secretary General, and welcome to our event space, Civic Hall, where we're proud to be a founding partner. For those who are new to New America, we are a think tank a civic enterprise dedicated to the renewal of American politics, prosperity, and purpose in the digital age. If you'd like to learn more about us, please visit our website at newamerica.org. Tonight's event represents the first ever public discussion among candidates for Secretary General, uh, in, and this is in the United Nations 70-year history. And we're delighted to have with us four of the candidates with, uh, for that process this evening. In addition to this more open approach, we've also seen a more transparent nomination process, as well as informal hearings with individual candidates for the first time, and that's been taking place at the United Nations this week. So who says change never comes to the United Nations? I'd like to thank our partners joining us this evening. First, The Guardian, uh, with special thanks to Rachel White and Rebecca Ashton, United Nations Association of the UK, and the One in Seven Billion campaign, with special thanks to Natalie Samarasinga and Richard Nelms. Uh, also, thank you to the future United Nations Development System with special appreciation to their leadership, Stephen Brown and Thomas Weiss. And of course, thanks to all of you for joining us this evening. I have a few housekeeping points. First is to please place your phones uh, on silent or vibrate. Uh, we'll have an audience Q&A uh, that will be moderated by Julian Borgia at the, towards the end of the program. And if you decide to ask a question, please know that you'll be consenting to being video recorded. And we hope you'll continue this conversation online as well as by tweeting with the hashtag UNSECGEN. Uh, to give us an introduction to tonight's debate, please join me in welcoming Natalie Samarasinga, the Executive Director of the UNA UK. Thanks. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is an enormous privilege to welcome you on behalf of UNA UK and the future, development, uh, future UN Development System Project at the CUNY Graduate Center to the first ever public interactive debate with candidates for UN Secretary General. Now you have here, of course, your own election drama that is unfolding, and I hope you don't mind me saying that for some of us across the pond, we have been watching the process with, um, how shall I put it, a little bit of bemusement. But of course what's happening here is a reflection of broader global issues and trends. We've seen in recent years a series of crises that have converged and have demonstrated the need for global action. But across the world I think governments have been reluctant to respond, turning inwards instead to their domestic constituencies. Many states have overemphasized their response to extremism rather than seeking to tackle root causes. Many have downgraded their international obligations, such as the universal ban on torture and the duty to uphold human rights. Growing numbers of refugees have precipitated a similar response with many states reluctant and shying away from their international obligations under the Refugee Convention. And I think it's fair to say there's a growing disconnect between people and governments and institutions as public trust in political and financial systems is being eroded. So the international system that we have built over the past 70 years, I don't think it will survive unless governments and people work to preserve and strengthen it. But political leadership is trapped in very narrow national agendas and international compromises of the type that made the UN possible in 1945 often appear much too costly when measured against the familiar criterion of national interest. 
And this is precisely why an open, inclusive, and merit-based selection process for the UN Secretary General is so important. As Suzanne said, it shows that the UN can change at a time when it is needed more than ever, but it is overstretched and underfunded. For many people, I think the UN is, seems to be a very distant organization, one that is opaque, a bit outdated maybe, and paralyzed often by power politics. Improving the selection process shows that the UN can become more transparent and inclusive. And of course, we hope that it will lead to a highly qualified, effective, and visionary leader being appointed. Someone who can work with the permanent members of the Security Council, that is vital. But also someone who will represent the wider UN membership and the world's 7 billion people. That was the starting point for the One for Seven Billion campaign, which UNA UK co-founded with partners such as the World Federalist Movement and the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung New York. We felt it was simply unacceptable for the Secretary General to be chosen in secret, subject to all sorts of backroom deals by the five permanent members of the Security Council who do not, let's be frank, always have the best interests of the UN at heart and who have traditionally been much more occupied by trying to find someone who will not upset them rather than the best person for the job. So we've worked really hard over the past few years to try and change this and to institute a timeline, selection criteria, a list of candidates, hearings with candidates, all the sort of basic recruitment elements that you would expect would take place in any organization, let alone one that promotes good governance. So we're absolutely delighted that we now have, for the first time in the UN's history, the names of those standing for the job, an idea of their vision for the UN, and opportunities for all member states to engage with them. I think the President of the General Assembly deserves a great deal of praise for ensuring that the meetings that have been taking place this week are webcast, and that they include at least a few questions from the public. But we at UNA UK and One for Seven Billion, well, we're campaigners. And it's our job to keep pushing and pushing for the process to become more robust and open. That is why we're calling for the next Secretary General to have a single longer term of office. What is the point of selecting a great person to do a job and then stop by the politics of seeking reappointment? And that is why, of course, we're holding today's event. We want to give you, the public, the chance to really get to know these candidates. Thank you all so much for making the time to be here doing what must be such a busy and intense week. We really, really appreciate it. So when we started to plan this event many, many months ago, I think I'd imagined something along the lines of the, um, the US primary debates. Um, I'm not sure we still want to go down that route. Uh, so have no fear, candidates. No one will be asking you to comment on the size of your hands or anything like that. But I hope that we will nonetheless have, I hope that we will nonetheless have some very spirited exchanges on the issues that the UN needs to be addressing. The debate tonight will be based on questions that our one for seven billion partners, Global Citizen and Avaz, have gathered through a survey involving nearly 25,000 people in 161 countries from Albania to Zimbabwe. We will also ask questions from NGOs within our network and questions that were solicited by the UN Non-Governmental Liaison Service, but that just missed out on being asked during the sessions at the UN. And then we'll hand over to you for an open Q&A. Thanks to New America, we have this wonderful intimate setting, and I think hopefully some of us also got a, got a drink before we took our seats. So candidates, I hope that you will relax. This is not the UN, there's no speakers lists, there are no formulate questions stroke statements from, from countries. Think of this a little bit like being your living room and think of us as your very nosy new neighbors who really just want to get to know you a little bit better. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage your moderator, The Guardian's Mark Rice Oxley, and of course, the distinguished candidates who are vying for the world's most impossible job. Thank you.
Kak Popal Air. How you like it? Oh, How you like it? <laughs> yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, time is short, so we should crack on. But I think I should just formally introduce the uh, the panel, the candidates before us tonight. To my immediate right, uh, Dr. Dr. Vesna Pusic, the former Deputy Prime Minister of Croatia. To her right, Natalia German, another former Deputy Prime Minister of Moldova. We have uh, Danilo Turk, the former President of Slovenia. And on the end, we have uh, Igor Luksic, uh, former, or, or current, the I think. Real. The real. <laughs> The real <laughs> Deputy Prime Minister of Mon Montenegro. Welcome to you all. I thought I'd throw you a nice and easy ball to start with and then make things a bit trickier later on. Um, perhaps, uh, Vesna, we could start with you. Um, uh, what do you think makes you the best candidate for this job? Whew. I told you it was going to be an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> well, when we come all from the same region it's a little more complicated than when you have people from different regions uh, but I would say having seen the UN uh, on the ground in my country uh, UN peacekeepers uh, during the war uh, having gone from being at war to being let's say a relatively normal country uh, having gone from being somebody who is receiving development assistance to somebody who is providing development assistance gave me some experience that at least curbs <coughs> arrogance, I think, to some extent, which I think will be very important uh, for anybody, but especially for the next Secretary General, uh, in facing and dealing with countries and people that are facing hardships of this, time, of this type now like wars, like, you know, wars are not only horrible, they're also extremely embarrassing. And everybody looks a little bit down on you. And to know what that feels like and to know that everybody who is in this situation actually is as surprised as you were and as you know, incredulous, I think helps. Also in, in my life, I've done many different things since I've been around for a long time. <laughs> so uh, I taught at the university, which is something that UN uses as experts, people from the academia. I founded and led an NGO during the war that was directly dealing in human rights issues and reconciliation uh, facilitated by the civil society rather than by elected politicians. And then finally in 2000, I became an elected politician and spent considerably more time in opposition and in parliament than in government, but also spent a term in government as a foreign minister. Um, so I've seen many different sort of aspects of being active and trying to move things forward. So mm -hmm. that might help. Okay. Um, Natalia, if I could move to you, what, what, what's the thing you're most passionate about? What would be the defining feature of your tenure if you were Secretary General? I think that the most challenging task would be to reform the United Nations in the sense of bringing uh, fresh ideas, fresh <coughs> solutions, in some words, um, deconcern <coughs> the system and make it better um, purpose and result oriented. In other words, United Nations these days has to be stronger, more adaptable, and deliver faster and more efficient on the common agenda, putting the people at the center and uh, leaving no one behind. And this is a challenging task because we know bureaucracies never reform too willingly or too fast. And in the 70 years of uh, the existence of the United Nations, uh, there were attempts to reform and there were even some successes. But this time we simply don't have the luxury of the time and uh, the nature of modern world where the traditional definitions of threats, challenges and conflicts do not apply. Where we have to deal continuously with eradicating poverty in some areas. We see the uh, emergence of new actors. We have to cope with the threat of international terrorism. 
and deliver on the climate change agenda, we don't have this time. We have to do something uh, fast and do something uh, now and very well uh, to make sure that we are fit for the job because our citizens are expecting nothing less than that from now. Mm. I think that will be the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And uh, Danilo, if I could turn to you, what would we see in your first 100 days as Secretary General? What would, what would be your overriding priority at the beginning of, of a term? Now, of course, uh, <clears throat> in the political sphere, uh, it will be a test on how much progress can we make to bring P5 closer together. Now, of course, this sounds fairly unrealistic, but it is also necessary. I think it's not entirely impossible. I don't say that uh, this must succeed in the first 100 days, but this should be tried from start. And I believe the objective for the Secretary General would be to help building something that I would call a global security understanding. I can describe it further if necessary. Uh, the other thing is to put the uh, institutional uh, arrangements that are being now designed for the Sustainable Development Goals in the right order. Uh, that means a high-level political forum will have to be uh, sufficiently well-defined in terms of its agenda and servicing. I'm encouraged by the fact that the Statistical Commission of the United Nations has done a very good work on indicators to measure progress in Sustainable Development Goals. And as we know, we cannot manage something that we cannot measure. And I think we can measure things to some extent and manage them better. Of course, later on, we'll need a more um, rich, richer toolkit to deal with these things. And that can also be discussed. And on a short-term basis, I think we can do something in the Secretariat as well. Uh, I can perhaps, if I was Secretary General, I would convene a small group of key officials in the Secretariat and insist that we have to shorten the period of time needed for recruitment of new people. Uh, we will have needs for recruitment, especially the, with regard to the Millennium Development Goals, Sustainable Development Goals, and we need to shorten that period. Uh, you are probably aware, I mean, it now lasts almost 200 days to recruit a person for a job in the United Nations. Of course, there are reasons to go through various vettings and background checkings and all these things. But this can be made shorter. I think the procedures have become long. And you're asking specific questions about 100 days. I would say this should be the first week. No, but you see, we have to strengthen. We have to change the process. And we can do it. Peter, can I bring you in at this point? Um, forgive me, that there were some betting odds today which put you at 10 to 1, making you an outsider. Do you think you're worth putting a few quid on? <laughs> Ten to one. Well, it's, it's, well, no, it, oh, it's already progress because <laughs> day before yesterday it was 21, 25 to one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, good evening to all, and I'm really grateful to our hosts for convening us here tonight because I think this is really another historical event. I, I agree with what has been said in, in, in the introductory remarks because, I mean, uh, yesterday today, tomorrow, we are really doing something new, uh, which has never been done before. And it is quite important. It will increase, for sure, the level of transparency. And I'm sure that Gini cannot be brought back into the bottle. I, I think that's quite important. And can you just imagine, uh, whatever we agree, whether it's uh, one uh, tenure in office lasting five or seven years, or, or two for 10 years, can you imagine? <laughs> Uh, next time you go to the hearing or informal dialogue, how complex it is going to be, uh, that people will simply start asking, okay, you told us five or seven years ago, okay, this and that. Have you delivered? Why not? What was your problem? Uh, so I, I've decided to join this, this competition because I really believe the UN needs something new. It needs some new, new uh, not only new faces, it needs new approaches. And uh, what I've tried to do is, you know, along with giving my <coughs> views how uh, the world or UN World Organization should handle peace and security, sustainable development, and human rights, uh, 
that we also should reinforce some aspects of our management. But the flavor I want to give it is does, uh, 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 okay, what, what are youth, what the world's youth think of today's world? Because many a research suggests that this is the best period in history a human being can be born. You know, IT, uh, medical uh, services, uh, you know, life expectancy grows and so on and so on. But are we really sure that the youth worldwide shares the sentiment? And don't forget, 20, uh, half of the world's population is, is younger than 25 years. So we need to give them something new. And I really agree with all those who contend that there's been some detachment between the UN <coughs> and ordinary people. We need to bring back this, this attachment. We need, to, we need to fight to make UN really relevant. We need, to, we need to make every penny spent for UN worthwhile investment. That's great. Well, thanks for those sort of introductory remarks. Now, you're all from Eastern Europe, and there's a reason for that, because it's said that this is Eastern Europe's terror. But shouldn't we just have the best person for the job, Italian? Obviously, we should have the best uh, person for the job, and the selection process should uh, focus on uh, meritocracy, professionalism, relevant professional experience and uh, the quality of morality and integrity of the candidates themselves. But at the very same time, uh, I think that uh, we need to take into consideration the very important ob objective to strive for the gender balance while uh, selecting uh, top officials uh, and senior management in the UN, in other international organizations, and indeed in our national systems back home. And another principle, the principle of uh, equitable geographical representation is something uh, that is very much uh, rooted actually into the United Nations system. And why not this time? For the very first time in 70 years of UN's existence, we might actually choose a good candidate from Eastern Europe to lead the organization, be it a woman or a man. Well, what's, what's more important, an Eastern European or a woman? <laughs> Ask the two of us. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's more than once. I can't like to put the gentleman on the spot here. I mean, in 70 years, we've never had a woman. Can't you feel that? Well, 70 years, we had, didn't have an Eastern European. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, I think that the discussion really is sometimes simplified to the <coughs> principles that have governed the UN um, s elections uh, throughout history. Mm. Of course, UN has to have a sense of fairness. And how do you achieve fairness in a country which, in, a, in, a, in an organization which represents all parts of the world without regional rotation? And I remember when the elections were held 10 years ago and Asia said we need to have an Asian candidate, nobody dared to object. 15 years earlier when Africa said we need an African, no one dared to object. But people sort of see Asia and Africa as geopolitical entities, Eastern Europe, perhaps less so? Or am I, am I creating a heresy here? Well, look, uh, you should be careful with this sort of characterizations. <laughs> <laughs> You, you're lucky we are in a less formal setting tonight. <laughs> 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 uh, I spent some time in Eastern Europe and I never got into trouble. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> so, so, so maybe this is a common denominator. <laughs> <laughs> More seriously, um, don't we need to. I'm referring to you all as insiders, and we need to all be glittering careers within your own governments. You know the system. Isn't it time for an outsider? Is it time for a Trump candidate? And I, I don't mean. <laughs> by that, what I mean is somebody. You mean to make UN great again? <laughs> you know, do we need an outsider to come in and, and see the system for what it is and we all agree that there are flaws and things that we need fixing and perhaps an outsider will do that better? Help me out. An outsider to what? An outsider to the United Nations or an outsider to politics? I don't think you can have an outsider to politics because outsiders to politics would not be interested in these topics, wouldn't know anything in these topics. And uh, however much experience we might have in um, our countries, you're even questioning the right of our region 
to, to have qualified people, let alone our countries, which are all relatively small. So um, I think that if you want outsiders in that sense, you've got them. Certainly outsiders to the big system of the United Nations, not outsiders to the core topics of the United Nations. And I don't think you would want that. Actually, the core topics of the United Nations and the core values that the United Nations promote have been marginalized enough. And if anything, there was something that Igor said uh, earlier, we sort of need to reintroduce those, those values. And precisely because of that, I think it's important to shake up the, the system, not by you know, denying the importance of, of uh, any kind of political insight, political experience, political understanding, but yes, of some uh, iconoclastic attitude towards uh, set rules, even patterns of speech. I mean, half the time, nobody in his right mind can't understand what these people are t saying, what they're talking about. And I was studying for days abbreviations, and I decided that I was not going to do this, because this is ridiculous. This is an organization that is meant to serve the people, to serve some of the key objectives of and highest aspirations of humankind. And nobody can understand what people are saying. But so to 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 this is an important thing. Um, that language that will be a non-UN speech. Correct. correct. Yes. So where could you make that pledge? We didn't need to. <laughs> <laughs> we are implementing it. We don't speak UN. Maybe the outside was the wrong word. Maybe we should be talking about independence. And there is yes. a serious issue here. When you are Secretary General and you are appointing key staff, um, lots of people around the world, and we've had some of the questions that have come in, have expressed concern that the key jobs always go to the big powers. And maybe there's a reason for that, because if you want to be Secretary General, you kind of have to get on well with the <coughs> So will you say that when you're Secretary General, will we still see a French head of peacekeeping? Will we still see a Brit in, in one of these um, UN jobs? Or will, be, will it be a bit fairer? Eagle, what do you think? Well, you know, talking about the senior management team, we talk about a lot of, uh, lot of things that the Secretary General is supposed to try to change, uh, given, given the current uh, uh, track record. And, uh, you know, just imagine uh, Secretary General coming from Montenegro. It's not a key power. Uh, <laughs> and if, uh, if Secretary General, if, and, and that's what I would plan to do, uh, nominate Deputy Secretary General, I believe that because we come from Northern Hemisphere, that person should come from Southern Hemisphere. I also believe that that person should uh, have its seat in, uh, in Nairobi. Uh, and uh, for sure, uh, then we already uh, can uh, show our commitment to making it more regionally uh, you know, more regional, uh, regional equality, also uh, more commitment to uh, c create UN system with, where everybody feels ownership. Uh, and that's what I believe is important. My uh, three principles I'm laying out are responsibility, inclusiveness, engagement. So we need to try to do things which will resonate, which will make people feel, okay, we are really on, on track of becoming, on making it an inclusive and uh, to everybody's ownership uh, system. Uh, plus, uh, I mean, uh, that's, on the other hand, uh, uh, when you talk to different people, they raise argument and say, listen, it's all nice, but uh, there's 17 countries that provide for 82% of the UN budget. So we want to have a say uh, about how money is spent. It's a pretty fair argument. You need to take into account. Uh, so, th th so a Secretary General should have to be able to try to balance it, balance it out. Of course, ha uh, has to try to uh, 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 also uh, uh, has, has to pursue the principle of uh, gender equality. Uh, so uh, saying, new, uh, uh, saying about uh, or mentioning new faces, it also means, you know, okay, let's uh, open the floor for, uh, for uh, different people. Okay, if we're also talking about, you know, a big country, okay, give us some more names. Let's try to make it a more interactive, more transparent procedure. And that's why it is important that we are now entering the new age of 
appointing Secretary General and other people because it will inevitably lead to more transparency and, and more discussions but about is there, is other there places. Are sort of any of you feeling, you know, I've started my campaign and already there's a kind of whisper in the ear, you know, we'll, we'll back you if, uh, if, I'll, if, I'll, if I'll, our person gets <laughs> I mean, that, that happens, right? That can do. It's entirely Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> 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 I feel very feel very comfortable. No, no. <laughs> look, people who think about these things are also very sophisticated, <laughs> and they would not come with this sort of pressure, I mean, very simply and very quickly. Uh, that may come later and may take different forms. But I'd like to explain my own experience. You see, uh, I was invited by Kofi Annan to become his assistant for political affairs in the year 2000. And I know that at that time there was a fair amount of competition from other countries, from larger countries, from countries which pay more dues to the United Nations. Nevertheless, Kofi Annan invited me, and I, was, uh, I, w I felt very honored by that, I, because I knew the kind of configuration which existed at the time. Now, it is doable. It is doable. But of course, the Secretary General has to be absolutely convinced that the person chosen is the right person for the job. And that, of course, helps resisting pressures. That helps him to say, look, I found the right person. And I think that that experience is a small part of the answer to this bigger question. I want to get into some of the questions that we've had. As Natalie mentioned earlier, more than 20,000 questions from around the world from our um, call out. I'm just going to go through them one by one. <laughs> so so we, can, we can start responding and wait until October, until this whole process ends. <laughs> The implementation for, for real hasn't really started yet. Uh, and this is going to be one of the big problems, how to develop the strategies to implement, first of all, because the sustainable development goals are to some extent different from the millennium development goals because they have some additional elements such as the rule of law and uh, uh, some elements of human rights, uh, also some goals that were part of the millennium goals that were not uh, met, such as position of women and, and uh, women's rights. Uh, one thing that I think might help uh, is to broaden the base of countries that get involved in development cooperation because the current model very much is the big donor countries that provide development assistance, uh, the big organizations and uh, poor countries or poorer countries <coughs> that are recipient of development uh, assistance. Uh, they also get uh, told the, a lot uh, you cannot rely only on official development aids. You need to develop your own economies, investment climate, uh, private investment, direct private investment. You have to attract all of that in order to improve your economies, which to some extent is absolutely true, at least for most countries. I think there are countries that, that are exception even in that sense uh, that need special attention. but. Most of the countries are in between. Most of the countries are not necessarily the big rich countries, but are also countries that don't need or don't receive development uh, assistance and can, but have absolutely no tradition of development cooperation and providing development assistance that will not be billions of dollars, that will not be huge projects, but can be, and if well coordinated, even small projects that make a difference. And let me just illustrate that with uh, one project that we started in Afghanistan, which is building a, a small maternity hospital for training midwives. We started this as, as Croatia. Uh, 
it is going to train midwives in, in the community, <coughs> meaning people who will come there and train for six months and then go and help uh, women in the, in the villages. One such small hospital is not may, m going to make any difference, or certainly not the big difference in Afghanistan. And we didn't have more money than for just this one hospital. But bringing 10 countries of our size and economic sort of capacity together, bringing 20 countries together, and building a network of these would actually make a big difference. And I think that in order, because sustainable development goals are not only about money, they're also, they are about money. Mm -hmm. That's certainly uh, the first prerogative. But they're also about transferring experience, knowledge, know-how, uh, people that can start something, uh, experience in institutions building, in, in state building, in post-conflict reconciliation, all kinds of things that influence uh, the economy, but are not only uh, the economy. And I think by broadening this base and going for <laughs> the countries that don't have now that tradition or that is not part of their, their culture, their foreign policy uh, culture, and bring them in as uh, countries initiating, not to say providing, uh, development assistance of financial and non-financial kind, I think would give the sustainable development goals a way better chance of implement, being implemented. We'll come back to the SDGs during the, the audience Q&A, but I've got a couple of others I want to, um, to, to quickly get through here. Um, we have a UN staff with Lebanon asking, following the case of Anders Kampus, the whistleblower who um, who revealed um, what had been going on um, with the peace cable and keep it. And what would you do to protect whistleblowers and prosecute peacekeepers rather than the other way around, which seems to be the UN approach so far? Well, Natalia. Well, look, I know Anders Kompas. Um, if I am elected Secretary General, I'll make sure that he's protected. I know him for, no, no, look, I mean, this is a very important case, which shows many, many problems that exist in the process in the United Nations. And of course, one of the key problems is why was this information uh, hidden from the decision makers for so long? What went wrong in the structure of the Secretariat? That has to be thoroughly investigated. And in order to have such an investigation, one has to protect the person who has spoken first. So Anders Kompas would have that kind of protection, but would that, need. That, that should happen, but it's, he's not the only one. This has happened again and again. The UN is terrible at investigating sure. its own people and protecting yeah. the people who, who, who blow the whistle. Well, look, but you have to work on specific cases. This is, of course, an, an, uh, an exemplary case. This is a case which defines the um, approach that will be taken in the future. I mean, that's why it is important that we know who the person is and we know that he's a credible person. He has demonstrated this in a number of situations in the past, in Colombia, in Central America, now in Central African Republic. So he is a person who has the kind of credibility which gives a good case to the Secretary General to say, okay, here we have a whistleblower that we need to protect and we'll build our new approach around this new, uh, well, this, this, this solution that we will find. Um, okay, so I was momentarily diverting. Um, another question we had was, again, about the uh, whole idea of accountability <coughs> um, within the UN um, from uh, Austin Mackle in uh, Ecuador. What will you do to make the UN more democratic and accountable? Mm -hmm. Very broad question, but Natalia, if I look I think that the Secretary General should first and foremost lead by example. You really have to be absolutely sure in your own credentials of uh, high standards of morality and integrity, and then you have the right to demand the same attitude uh, from uh, the staff who is working in your team, in the Secretariat, and all around the United Nations uh, system then they should inspire and they should uh, project this attitude in uh, absolutely everything they do and they uh, undertake. And that should be the first criteria while uh, hiring people for uh, important positions in the United Nations uh, 
secretariat. And uh, uh, also there is, uh, of course, uh, all, all kind of um, uh, inner structures and the ethical office within the Department of Legal Affairs. And when there are instances uh, of breaching this uh, very important uh, law and practice, they have to be thoroughly investigated. And there is no place for corruption, no place for fraud, <coughs> mismanagement, or waste of uh, resources uh, when it goes about uh, the performance uh, of the United Nations uh, Secretariat. And I think that should lead the efforts uh, of the Secretary General. Perhaps one last question from the crowd. Um, what more could be done for the tackle the world's um, growing refugee problem? Could that be further to you, Igor? Because I know that in your, uh, in your session um, with the General Assembly, we were put on the spot about this, and you questioned whether the EU Turkey deal, uh, or at least the UN's criticism of the EU Turkey deal, was, was, was correct. Yeah, it, it was actually my response to a question related to, to migration refugee crisis because it is really uh, a case which shows that we should try to do things differently because you know, there's a big problem going on and uh, Montenegro is a neighborhood of some of the countries that were on this Western Balkans route and the problem is still not over. It's still, I mean, we, we see a number of incidents going on still in the region and so on. Uh, so there was much desired uh, uh, agreement and eventually reached after a lot of sleepless nights, a lot, lot of rounds of discussions and so on. And the next day, you have very prominent specialized agency of the United Nations saying, well, you see that it's controversial, it might be illegal and so on. So it, it's a bit embarrassing. Uh, I think it shows that we should try to approach things differently. There has to be more communication. There has to be more work, more cooperation. When one of the meetings the I had... The issue was with the, with the object and the way it was done, not with the specific point of I mean, in general, uh, what, what I'm trying to say is that uh, this, this concrete uh, example shows that there has to be more cooperation between UN and uh, other uh, regional <coughs> arrangements, regional organizations. That's why we all talk about the need to improve this cooperation, because UN cannot do everything on its own. We have to, uh, that's why we talk, or I talk about extended partnerships. That's why I talk about better coordination. It cannot happen that some of the regional arrangements are more proactive and pushy than UN. Actually, UN should be there because we are talking about uh, early, uh, early, early uh, warning systems, prevention, mediation, so on. But what actually we do afield, uh, there's a lot more that can be done. That's one aspect of the refugee or migrants problem. The other aspect is, uh, I guess, even more complex. Because currently you have 60, 65 million people, <coughs> uh, biggest number since the Second World War, uh, migrating involuntarily because you have millions of people who want to move and settle somewhere else because they just want to change uh, uh, the environment where, li where they live. Uh, interestingly enough, but uh, I've seen some research shows that actually it's, there's 200 million people worldwide that wants to, want to change the, the way, where, where they live. And if they're allowed, that may actually give boost to world GDP. But the trouble is, and that's why I like this story about sustainable development goals, is that it's not only about GDP growth. There's a lot more than that. But coming back to this, this uh, I'm, actually, I'm actually trying to, to, to uh, underscore that social, uh, sustainable development goals, is, it's, it is also about migration. International Migration Organization actually finds out that there is five or six goals where inside there are targets related to migration. So it's a lot more complex. And that's why the only way to, to, to try to find some solutions is through, uh, is through uh, extended partnerships and cooperation. Great. Do you agree with that principle point there that in order to solve what is one of the most intractable problems of migration, forced migration, um, the UN needs to preeminence over groups like the EU, which is proving it just can't really matter. Well, I'll be a little more, I, allow me to differ a little on the evaluation of the, the EU uh, approach. First of all, I think that it's absolutely essential to cooperate with regional organizations because otherwise things are undoable. <coughs> and why EU was uh, faced with having to deal with the uh, 
It's not a migration issue, it's a refugee issue. I mean, uh, I think we have to be very clear. We were, at the beginning, there was about 70% of people uh, who were coming through, so to speak, uh, Eastern Europe and our countries. 70% uh, were Syria and Iraq, who were acknowledged refugees. And 30% were Afghanistan, who were supposedly migrants. But if you look, and as time went on, that ratio changed and became 50-50. Uh, but you look at the migrants from Afghanistan is, I think, a very questionable definition, depending on where these people are coming from and what they're running away from. So I think they also could be viewed as refugees to a large extent. Secondly, uh, the problem here was that None of them, and this is where the UN jumped in maybe a little bit before they thought. It is true that it was very difficult for Europe to deal with it. Everybody fought with everybody else, not because there were that many refugees, but because there were that many refugees in such a short period of time. It was well, close to a million people in less than, than six months. Um, but. The fact was that they, none of them came directly from Afghanistan or directly from Syria or directly from Iraq. They all came from Turkey. And they've all spent between a few months to a few years in Turkey, in which they were refugees. Turkey, I have to say, was pointing this out. And at least from what I heard, personally from 2012 was saying people in front of the European Union, in front of the entire world, saying people, we will not be able to deal with this. There are too many people coming in that we have to, to take care of, help us. They even mentioned the number. They even said how much money they spent. Uh, and for a long time, everybody is patting them on the shoulder and not doing much. And then at one point, they opened the gates and people started coming in across the Aegean, the Aegean, whatever you say in, 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 in English. But these people were refugees, but these people <coughs> were not coming from con directly from countries where, they were, where their lives were in danger. They were coming from a country that just was not helped in time to, to provide them with uh, assistance. And in that context, the EU deal is probably too little too late, but makes much more sense than if it was returning them to people to a country uh, where their li lives were in danger. Okay. I, would, I want to pause it there because we've got a fantastic audience. 